Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, Adib Dada. I'm uh, calling in from uh, Beirut, uh, which is where I'm from. Um, I'm uh, born and raised uh, in Beirut, and um, you can hear my son in the background. It's his bedtime, so he'll be he'll be off in a few minutes. Um, I am a trained as an architect. Okay, we a way. I'm trained as an architect, uh, as well as uh, having studied um, uh, design and technology at uh, NYU and um, biomimicry at, um, with the Biomimicry Institute and Arizona State University. So, so basically today I'm going to be talking about planting liberation through building habitat for humans and other creatures to thrive. Uh, I'll be, the, I mean, the main theme is really how can designers create conditions conducive to life, uh, building interspecies habitats for humans and other uh, creatures as well. So I'm going to be taking you through my approach. So as I'm trained um, as an architect, so it's really a building uh, base. So, you know, what is the building approach? What is the, what does it entail to build a human habitat? What does it entail to build other types of habitat? but also how to build a narrative around uh, the work that we are doing. And we're going to finish off on he building healing habitats and finally interspecies habitat. So uh, the, the other data is uh, the company that I founded back in 2010. Uh, it is a regenerative consultancy and architecture firm working on urban afforestation in the Middle East. So our work spans architecture, uh, landscape, interiors, consultancy, um, our forest making side, and then our um, research-based uh, innovation habitat. So I'm going to be taking you through some of the challenges that, that we uh, face. So at the moment, cities are not serving us well. Um, governments pay millions of dollars every year in environmental degradation, mitigation, and healthcare costs. We have a you know, an urban heat increase, uh, alarming cancer rates and cardiovascular diseases, very little green space per capita. In Lebanon, it's less than one square meter per capita. And urban areas around the world are flooding as rainstorms are getting more intense because, uh, due to the climate crisis. Temperatures in cities are rising. Forests are burning and deserts are expanding. Rivers are being dammed, and these projects are often financed uh, as loans by international organizations such as the World Bank. Air pollution has reached very alarming levels around the world, but especially in Lebanon, uh, which now has the highest death rate due to the burning of fossil fuels in all of the Middle East North Africa region. The world spends $1.8 trillion every year financing its own extinction. So this is an article that appeared in The Guardian uh, last week. Um, and it's quoting a study where uh, it's, it's showing where government spending is going. And it's, it's actually going against the, uh, the, you know, the, the Paris Accord. It's going on, a lot of money is going on tax breaks for beef production in the Amazon. Uh, a lot of money is going to financial support for unsustainable groundwater pumping in the Middle East, subsidies and government spending, which are directly harming the environment, and financing water pollution, land subsidence, and deforestation with state money. So this is directly working against the goals of the Paris Agreement and the targets on reversing biodiversity loss. So how do we address the crises of biodiversity, uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, as well as human rights abuses? For me, it's about understanding our place within nature. So moving from this um, kind of conventional way of, of thinking, the prevalent way of thinking that, you know, not only humans are at the top, but actually man is at the top and often a white man at the top women and other mammals as second tier, and then going all the way down to fungi and, and other uh, organisms. So moving from that into an ecosystem where we understand that we are nature and that we, are, we have equal rights with all of the other organisms that we share the planet with. And moving beyond sustainability into this idea of regeneration. 
So in our conventional approach, society and ecology are at the service of economy. So how do you transition from an economic model to an ecological perspective, where economy becomes a tool for society to be able to live comfortably within the ecological and planetary boundaries? And moving beyond sustainability into interdependence, understanding that the health of the planet, human health, and the health of the built environment are all intertwined. So again, how can designers create conditions to support other life? We look to nature to inspire a better built environment. And as this quote by Richard Powers, life took hold and shaped a hostile planet into something more conducive to life. So what if we could apply that same thinking to our cities? And here enters biomimicry. So I'm just gonna give a brief uh, background on biomimicry. It is the conscious emulation of 3.8 billion years of time-tested wisdom. So this is the time that life appeared on our planet and organisms have evolved to mitigate and live through challenges that are far bigger than what we are seeing right now. So there's a lot of knowledge that we can, uh, that we can learn from the natural world. So for example, nature needs only two kinds of polymers to create these beautiful underwater ecosystems. And humans have created more than 350 kinds of polymers to make up our landfills. So how can nature be so elegant? Again, um, in the desert, termite mounds. So these are termite mounds. They require zero fossil fuels to keep their buildings, their structures, within one degree Celsius all year round. Whereas our cities require 20% require of the world's annual energy use to keep our buildings within one degree Celsius. So how can we learn from these teeny tiny organisms? In essence, human systems are still simple. They haven't matured, whereas biological systems are complex. We follow a linear flow of resources instead of a closed loop flow. Human systems are wasteful instead of being zero waste. They are centralized and monocultural instead of being distributed and diverse. They are fossil fuel dependent instead of running on solar income. And they are extractive instead of being regenerative. So gonna briefly just go through some, uh, some of our architecture work just to, just to show how we apply this, uh, this uh, thinking. And the idea is what if our buildings were safe and regenerative? free from toxic chemicals and beneficial to the surrounding communities. Considering the whole life cycle of a project, its functionality, quality, and therefore the experience of its users. So one of the really interesting um, uh, references uh, is the living building challenge, because I really found like a lot of overlap between, uh, so it's, it's a building, it's the most, um, it's, it's the toughest building certification out there. And I found that it had lots, uh, lots of parallels with uh, ideas from biomimicry. So the idea is that how do we restore, so any, in any built uh, project, how do we restore a healthy interrelationship with nature? How do we create developments that operate within the water balance? How do we rely only on current solar income? How do we create environments that optimize physical and psychological health and well-being? How do we endorse products that are safe for all species throughout time? How do we support a just and equitable world? And how do we celebrate design that uplifts the human spirit? And in biomimicry, there are three different levels of emulation. So we are, we are not copying nature, we're emulating nature. So the easiest, the simplest uh, way of emulating nature is form. So for example, emulating the form of a flower for a certain um, project, uh, emulating process or emulating systems. So what if our buildings could act like a tree? So in a tree, uh, leaves, they have so many different functions. They cool the air through evapotranspirations. So what if we think that our building skin can actually be doing some of those uh, services as well? Uh, leaves also filter air pollution from the air. They absorb sound, they block rainfall, they provide shade, they reduce wind speed. The roots provide habitat for birds, mammals, and insects. They also stabilize the tree, stabilize the soil, and prevent erosion. 
So this is one case that, that we used, uh, going back to the termite mounds. So in this case, it's like, how does nature control heat? So the challenge is to maintain a constant temperature and to protect from predators. And the solution that the termites came up with is to create these self-cooling mounds that ventilate, cool, and heat entirely through natural means by using biomass and very cleverly positioned openings. And the benefit is that they are able to maintain an optimal constant temperature all year round. So in this uh, project, Landform House, that we built in Saudi Arabia back in 2017, we got inspired by the termite mounds. Uh, we got also inspired by the traditional Malkov, so the wind towers of uh, Saudi Arabia and the region. And we developed this model, whereas we shaped the house that we were working on to benefit from the wind so that we could naturally ventilate the house as much as possible. And so these are like the wind towers that we have created that, ha that are completely embedded within the architecture. And they actually allow us to cool um, three rooms within that house entirely through natural means without using any air conditioning. And then this also goes on to the interior. So in this, uh, in this case here, the furniture that we've used comes from uh, 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 like our sustainable uh, furniture from sustainable manufacturers. The carpet is uh, upcycled from old carpets that have been threaded and then uh, retransformed into the design that we have uh, uh, provided the manufacturer. The, um, the wood that is used uh, in the house uh, comes from FSC certified sources. Uh, it is void of any uh, solvent or formaldehyde. The paint is a natural-based paint, water-based paint. So the idea is that you know, we, we cannot just think of the exterior. We have to think of how the building interacts with its natural ecosystem, how it interacts with its inhabitants, but also how the interiors, because this is where we spend most of our time, are also uh, beneficial to our health. And now I'm gonna take you into building other habitats, which is the main focus of today's presentation. So what if our cities were as effective and generous as a forest, providing not only for ourselves, but for other species as well, in perfect balance with the operating conditions of planet Earth? So by using biomimicry at the systems level, so the highest level of emulation, we have developed the Beirut River genius of place. And the idea is that we can bring back the ecosystem services to improve the resilience of the city and the living condition of the communities nearby. So we propose to plant dense native forests for resilient cities. And the benefits of urban forests are helping fighting climate change, filtering air pollution, cooling down cities, protecting biodiversity, managing urban floods, restoring the water cycle, improving physical and mental health. They also align perfectly well with the UN SDG goals number six on clean water, 11 on sustainable cities, 13 on climate action, and 15 about life on land. Why do we use these uh, dense urban native forests? It's because these forests are dense, they are native, they can work in any environment from the tropics to harsh deserts. They're also fast growing and they become maintenance free within three years time. They can be planted in very small, one square meter to very big plots of degraded lands. And we use the Japanese Miyawaki method of forest making because it is scientifically proven to be one of the best ways for cities to mitigate the climate crisis. And this methodology has been recognized worldwide, uh, mainly through a project drawdown, which lists the top 80 solutions uh, to be able to draw carbon down from the atmosphere. Uh, the World Economic Forum that calls Miyawaki forests as a secret weapon against climate change. And the mayor of Paris is using this methodology to plant more than 170,000 trees throughout the capital. So we're proposing to use uh, to plant these native uh, Miyawaki forests instead of having conventional landscaping. Because these uh, multi-layered forests are 10 times faster growing, they are 30 times denser, which means they can sequester 30 times more CO2 and more pollution. They are completely organic. They are very biodiverse. 
They require half the investment than conventional landscaping and they become water and maintenance free within just three years. They can be used uh, and designed into any shape that we want. They can integrate art like these uh, um, uh, uh, structure like installations that will eventually be floating in the branches of the trees. They can be used as a fence. They can even be planted in the desert. And we've been using them as an educational tool, planting forests with the youngest generations. And our first kind of inspiration um, has been the natural ecosystem at the Beirut River. Because the Beirut River has always been a source of fresh water to the city of Beirut and the city of Beirutus, which, is, which used to be a very important Roman city. And nowadays, our government transformed, I mean, most of the country into infrastructure. So they've transformed the river from a healthy ecosystem into a basically sewage infrastructure. And then they've added solar panels on top of that, which add on to the artificiality of this uh, river and further disconnect the communities from the river. They've introduced invasive and exotic species in their uh, public uh, landscaping, such as the eucalyptus, uh, ailantus, and the lantana. They have dumped garbage in the river in 2015 and in 2016. And this is the peak of the uh, trash crisis that we had. So this, uh, this is about a 20 meter high trash mound um, over several kilometers in the concrete riverbed in 2015. Raw sewage is dumped directly into the river as well as industrial waste. And all of this flows into the Mediterranean Sea, making it a local problem with a global impact. So how do we bypass these systems? The way that we decided to go is that think global, but act local. And I love this quote by uh, Wangari Maithai. It's the little things citizens do. That's what will make the difference. My little thing is planting trees. So we planted the very first native urban forest in Lebanon. Beirut's riverless forest. So as you can see, there's the concrete river at the top of the picture here. In the summer, it's uh, only raw sewage and industrial waste that go through the river because all of the fresh water is pumped at source by private water bottling companies that eventually sell us back this water. And here you can see the first phase of the project that we have implemented. So this uh, uh, L-shaped corner here, uh, this tiny forest is six months old. And you can see here, you can compare with the forest that we were planting at the time this picture was taken. So at the time this picture was taken, you can, you can actually not see any of the trees or shrubs, but six months later, you can already start seeing them. And this is some of the selection of species in, the, uh, in our forest. So we have two types of oak trees. We have some laurel, bay leaf, uh, Judas tree, pine trees, pistachio trees, strawberry tree, wild jasmine. So a lot of edible and medicinal species as well. And this is our forest on the first day of planting. As you can see, the, the, the saplings are about 15 to 20 centimeters tall. This is it five months later. And this is it two years later. So just to give you kind of like the before and after. So this was the degraded uh, urban landfill that we reclaimed and transformed into this uh, tiny dense forest. And this, uh, this uh, fall, we actually worked on expanding this forest. So we had started with 200 square meters, 300 square meters, and we've just added 800 square meters around here. And this is the result with all of the volunteers working on the, on the planting. And the forest making process starts with the site selection. So once we decide on a certain location we'd like to plant, uh, we start by doing a native forest survey. So we travel to the closest natural uh, mature forest with a botanist and we study all of the species that are there from the smallest shrubs all the way to the biggest uh, trees. 
And we also study very importantly the interaction and the, uh, the ratio by which these species exist or coexist so that we are really replicating an ecosystem. We're not just copying what nature has done. So we're gonna put in oaks and pines. No? We know that in our case, you know, our forests are predominantly oak pine forest. So this is, uh, these are the subtleties that we are kind of looking for. Uh, then we go on with excavation. So we excavate the site because especially in urban areas, the soil is so compact and it's so full of trash. So we excavate the soil, we uncompact it, we clean it up from all uh, kind of debris. Then we prepare the land, we do our design. Finally, we do the planting and we move on to maintenance. And the forest requires regular watering de-weeding, mulching, rope tying, and compost tea making. So for two to three years, we're actively engaging the community in helping us care for this forest and watching it grow. And this is our way of getting them attached and getting them to appropriate uh, the space as their own. And since we're talking about planting liberation, uh, during the start of the revolution in Lebanon in 2019, we decided that uh, instead of waiting for the government or lobbying the government to produce the kinds of spaces that we wanted, we decided to take matters into our own hands and start actually reclaiming in a, uh, reclaiming these uh, public, uh, public spaces by digging up and just planting them with these tiny little uh, ecosystems. And so you can see our volunteers here uh, working. So the people were demonstrating throughout the day we were planting as well. And even uh, under the watchful eye of our military that eventually, as they were fighting us on the street during the revolution, but when they saw us actually planting and cleaning up the street and doing all sorts of recycling and upcycling and things like that, they actually pitched in to help us with our work. This is one of our projects in the most polluted city of Lebanon. So this is Zoo Musbih. You can see in the background the what is called the power plant of death. So this is uh, the most polluted city in Lebanon and one of the most polluted in the region. So we transformed this kind of road median, which was filled with kind of like dying grass, into a tiny urban forest that will be just a catalyst for a green lung in the city. And we also work on private projects with private landowners, convincing them to replace, or instead of going for conventional landscaping, to introduce these native forests uh, instead. And so in this case, we have restored a degraded ecosystem up in the mountains of Lebanon in a, in a ski resort. And uh, we have brought back the iconic cedar tree, the juniper trees, and uh, all sorts of other species that had completely been uh, logged from this area, but also grazed by uh, different types of animals. And we've also, uh, in 2019, won the DNDD Future Impact Award. And what's interesting about this is that already this gave us our first kind of recognition because this was as soon as we had just finished our first uh, project, but it also led to a corporate sponsorship uh, with them. So it really shows the and this is in um, uh, just a few months ago. So it really shows this kind of credibility that we managed to build uh, throughout the time and the uh, people seeing our projects uh, develop. So the NDAD decided to do a um, corporate sponsorship with us and to offset their um, awards that they give out every year. So every, every year they give out around 600 uh, awards. They're wooden pencils made of FSC certified wood, but they wanted to go a step further. So we are planting um, one tree for every pencil uh, award that they give out. And so this is a, a project that will span the length of uh, three years. And so here you can see we are taking away the asphalt so that we can actually restore um, native vegetation in this public park. And the way we measure success is threefold. One is the biodiversity regeneration. So we're looking at what kind of species are coming back to our forests. So of course, pollinators, fungi, lizards, birds, but also the soil regeneration. So we can see how the soil, which used to be dead, which used to be devoid of life, just in six months time is transformed into this rich brown soil. And we can start seeing earthworms and all sorts of uh, microscopic activity happening uh, in the soil. And what's very important is that 
healthy soil can actually sequester a great amount of CO2, much more than the forest itself. And finally, we look at the growth uh, success and we record the survival rate. So how many of our species survived? So our survival rate spans ranges from 70 to 95%, depending on the level of care and maintenance that is being uh, uh, offered on, the, on that particular site. And we measure the growth um, uh, of, the, of the trees in terms of length and uh, the height and the girth. So we keep this uh, track and of course, photographic, um, photographic uh, evidence as well. So I'm going to talk about building narrative and here I'm going to kind of take a step back and start talking about uh, green colonialism because this is something that we uh, face here with the case of the eucalyptus tree. So this is a post from the Slow Factory. Uh, eucalyptus trees are symbols of colonialism. So this is a very charged um, uh, notion, but actually, so because this case applies in Lebanon, but in general, um, white colonists planted eucalyptus trees all over the world. So they had various reasons for doing this. Uh, beauty, changing the type of uh, ecosystem uh, to something that they were more used to, uh, a fast growing fuel resource, uh, but it was also used to dry up this, uh, the swamps. And in our case, this is what happened. So in Lebanon, uh, the, when we were under French mandate, the, the French planted a lot of eucalyptus trees all over the territory, but especially along the rivers in an effort to dry out the floodplain of the river. And this ended up, uh, this species of tree ended up being turning into a very aggressive invasive species because eucalyptus is a very thirsty tree and it increases the effect of water scarcity in areas like Lebanon, Palestine, and Kenya. It has no, no natural predators to eat and decompose the toxic leaves and the bark outside of Australia where the koala is the main predator. Eucalyptus trees, um, became an invasive species that poses an ongoing threat also to wildlife and biodiversity. So the eucalyptus is allelopathic, which means it gives off, it gives off um, uh, chemicals in the air that inhibit the native species from regenerating. And on top of that, the resin of these trees is highly flammable, making areas like the West Bank of Palestine and California even more vulnerable to uncontrollable wildfires. And then I'm going to talk about the case of Palestine. So in Palestine, um, Israeli parks erase and displace. So what happened is that in an effort to erase the history and the culture of, uh, of Palestine and of Palestinians and say that, you know, this area was devoid of life and devoid of culture, what happened is that a lot of uh, Palis uh, 182 Palestinian villages were depopulated. And they were concealed under parks, which are made up of non-native flora. And mostly those are made up of pines because this is what looks uh, more cultured or more civilized. And this has led to huge uncontrollable wildfires that are burning through these areas and actually revealing the ruins of these villages that were supposedly you know, not even there before. So this is a case of green colonialism, a case of, uh, and a case of greenwashing as well. And Dr. Vandana Shiva says, the rupture of our oneness with planet Earth is a very deep construct of, con of colonialism. So this was also used as a way to further the colonialist agenda. And I love this quote by uh, a friend of mine. She says, we are the lands that we come from. And so when the landscapes are diminished, our cultures go with them. If we cannot harvest Zaytun and Kharu, we eventually forget how to. The songs we sing about them also disappear. Every time an element of the land disappears, the culture itself transforms too. But greenwashing is also not just about governments. It's also uh, used by corporations. Uh, it's very cheap and easy to plant a tree. What is very difficult is to actually maintain these and make sure that they are the right trees planted in the right place and that they will not harm other ecosystems and that they will survive throughout time. 
So many governments and companies use tree planting as a way to greenwash their carbon footprint and ecosystem destruction. So the case of a Mexican incentive program, which led to more deforestation. So the government was offering money to farmers to plant trees. But what they did is that they actually started deforesting so that they could plant new trees and that they could get collect uh, those incentives. Uh, in Dubai, a short-sighted development project led to the killing of one million trees, like in, the ma in a matter of just like a month time. In Turkey, one of the largest tree planting efforts, out of the 10 million trees that were planted, 9 million of these trees have died because there was no proper program in place and there was absolutely no follow-up. So indigenous land stewardship is a critical part of the solution to this imbalance. As are tree planting efforts that prioritize native species and continued care for the seedlings, at least for the initial two to three years that they need to become self-sufficient. It is far more labor intensive to take care of those trees and cultivate them into a thriving forest. So we do these acts of indigenous resistance. So healing land to restore balance for all life forms. So part of this resistance to colonialism is the rehabilitation of the land for the sake of restoring the balance for all life forms, but also healing from the trauma inflicted upon the land and upon people. So this is us planting a really teeny tiny forest just to show, you know, with the background of this power plant of death, just to, so that we are able to kind of like have this narrative and have points of discussion with shopkeepers and, you know, people passing by in their cars and things like that. So it's not just about the, the physical effect of the forest, but the, the narrative uh, is also very powerful. So I'm going to show you a, a short documentary that was just released about our work that will introduce the context of Lebanon and uh, also the, uh, the projects that we have been working on. Situated on the Mediterranean coast, Beirut is Lebanon's largest city. Political chaos and economic collapse have pushed it to the brink. Lebanon's economy has crashed into a tailspin. The whole country is facing an environmental crisis. Beirut streets drowning in trash. In 2020, Beirut was hit by one of the biggest explosions in history. Three thousand tons of incorrectly stored ammonium nitrate exploded in the port, flattening a huge part of the city. This was the latest chapter in the city's man-made environmental crisis, and it almost cost eco-activist Adib Dada his life. I was at the office. I had brought my daughter with me when the explosion happened. We heard the sound and instinctively I punched over my daughter. The ceiling collapsed on us, but I had to literally pull me out from under the rubble. Adib's daughter was fortunately unharmed, but in protecting her, it turned out he'd broken his back. One of my vertebras was completely collapsed. Narrowly avoiding death and paralysis, Adib felt his efforts to cleanse the city had come to an end. I was lying in bed and there was nothing that I could physically do. Then after a few days, I felt re-energized and I actually felt how important it was not only to continue the work that we were doing, but to really ramp up the campaign and really scale it up. Adib Dada is the leading voice in a green movement. He and his team are fighting pollution with tools and native saplings. This was a great way to lead our green revolution, not by complaining about what the city had become, but actually showing how we wanted the city to look like. Beirut has very little public space, let alone green space. Lebanon has the highest death rate due to air pollution in all of the Middle East. This explosion definitely added to the toxic load of Lebanon. A cloud of toxicity took over the city and went up into the mountains. Adib and his team are healing their broken city by planting trees in the urban center 
which will grow into tiny forests with the pioneering Miyawaki method, developed by botanist Dr. Akira Miyawaki in the 70s for Tokyo, the densest city in the world. Learning from international experts, Adib mastered the art of mimicking larger forest ecosystems on a smaller, tightly packed scale. High density planting promotes faster growth, so being 30 times denser means that they can reduce 30 times more pollution from the surrounding air. Our forests are maintenance free. We only plant native trees that for millennia have cared for themselves. Native forests support native biodiversity, the native insects and the native microorganisms in the soil. Adib began by planting the first mini forest alongside the most polluted part of the city, the Beirut River. Concreted over in the 60s, decades of pollution, factory dumping and raw sewage turned this once vibrant natural water source into a toxic stream. Since Roman times, the river was used as a source of fresh water. Then the river died. Since it was encased in concrete, it became a no man's land. The forest will help in restoring the water cycle. It will help in regulating the temperature of the city. We had hundreds of people, some of them for the first time in their life, coming and planting a tree. People now have a reason to come back into this once unloved area. Tree planting on degraded lands is proven as the best way for cities to be able to mitigate climate change. The forest can be planted anywhere. As long as you have access to soil and sunlight, the tiniest place. Adib has planted seven urban native forests so far. But this is just the start. If it can be done in Beirut, it can be done anywhere. A movement has started to create tiny forests across the globe. Each forest acts as a carbon sink, combating climate change and creating a shared space for humans and wildlife. Despite its tortured past, today Beirut has an army of people willing to fight for a better future. My hope is that people will be empowered enough to demand change themselves. And so after um, the explosion that happened in, on August 4, 2020, we shifted a bit kind of the approach um, of our work. And in memory of the people that uh, passed away on that day, we planted the Remembrance Forest, which was a, just a very kind of impulsive, very simple um, action of um, writing down the names of every single um, of every single victim and planting that with the trees into the, into the soil. And now the idea is that the families of the victims have a place that they can come and just watch this forest grow. And in addition to that, we've started working with schools. Um, um, so we've started working with an organization that is restoring the playgrounds of schools that have been uh, destroyed by the blast. And we started uh, helping them and introducing tiny pockets of forests in those playgrounds. So the playgrounds are mostly concrete. And so we come in, we, we destroy the concrete, and then we turn little patches into tiny forests. So this is one of our, um, this is one of our projects. So about 50 uh, species of um, uh, trees and shrubs uh, are planted here for the children to be able to uh, watch them grow. And another way that, uh, that we use is, is uh, through culture and art. So we started this uh, program um, in a partnership with Temporary Art Platform. So Art, Ecology and the Commons is an interdisciplinary program to bring artistic and ecological practices together and build a community around Beirut Serverless Forest. So our first edition was a 10 day long festival within the newly planted forest, where we had environmental film screenings happening every night, where we had um, tem uh, temporary and permanent art installations, such as uh, this one, 
a river eulogy by artist Cheryl Samuel Hon, which reads, here lies, uh, here lies that which was sculpted by water. Beirut River died in 1968. Um, Palestinian artist Mirna Bemye uh, did a water feast. So inspired by the Armenian water festival that used to happen on the banks of the river when the river was still natural, she did this, uh, organized this water feast uh, within the forest where she picked uh, leaves from all the different uh, uh, shrubs and trees and she distilled their water and created different water cocktails um, from them. So a different way to enjoy the forest. And artist Petra Sarhal um, did actual physical healing uh, um, uh, waters and massages and things like that from recipes that she learned from her grandmother again, using the species, the medicinal species from the forest itself. So our initiative, The Other Forest, is a nature-based tool for ecological and social regeneration in cities and beyond. By implementing urban afforestation, we can regenerate degraded leftover lands into a shared space between humans and native fauna and flora, tackling urban flooding, reducing pollution, and urban heat island effect at the same time essentially working with nature to transition our cities to healthy and resilient communities. Reclaiming degraded land as public space, regenerating ecological systems and social connections. So far, we are at 10 forests and counting, reclaiming over 3,600 square meters of degraded land, planting more than 10,000 trees and shrubs from 26 different native species, having the help of more than 800 volunteers and winning over five awards. So how do we bring it all together? How do we get all of these things working together? So for me, planting is a political act. The act of reclaiming degraded lands is a political act because the system in place, I'm not just gonna talk about government, but the system itself, assigns value and gives, let's say, more value to, you know, let's say to fossil fuels or to man-made objects than it does to nature. So how do we reclaim this nature that has been uh, deemed as unvaluable and that has been left to degrade or actively um, destroyed? So healing, reclaiming this, healing it and turning it back into a natural space, into a public space is a political act. And the power of civil society is really strong and it can be seen in, so kind of referring back to one of the other rivers that was um, uh, saved. So in, in Bistri in Lebanon, um, so a project that was funded uh, as a loan by the World Bank, but under the enormous pressure of the revolution and actors uh, of the civil society, the World Bank finally announced the withdrawal of its loan for the Bistri Dam. So this had never happened in Lebanon. So this is really like kind of shows the power of the people. So let's bring our waters and earth back to health. This way we can begin to come together as a cohesive society, the common stewards of this earth. Thank you very much. I'd like to open up for questions, comments, anything that you'd like. Adib, this has been so beautiful. Of course, I was uh, completely crying during the video. <laughs> we don't have a lot of open questions in Q&A, so I would love for you to uh, maybe talk a little bit more about the collaborations you, you briefly mentioned at the very end with the water. And if we can go back to, uh, to them a little bit and see what other projects are around that are merging art and um, and uh, let's say ecology, and, uh, and, and that are in Lebanon. And um, just tell us a little more because you went through them quite, quite quickly. It's been such an interesting uh, lecture overall, um, especially I, would, I was reading the, the chat when you were also talking about the um, architectural uh, spaces that you created in Saudi Arabia. Maybe we go back to that as well and talk about um, from the landscape uh, of, uh, you know, biomimicry and the observation of nature and how from that observation, you all made some design decisions, let's say, and 
it wasn't the other way around where you're like moving from an aesthetic into, well, we want this aesthetic, can you please make it work? And it's something I've been writing a lot about when uh, I talk about uh, ecosystems over aesthetics and ecosystems first and aesthetics follow and the, uh, the aesthetics of sustainability as well, because you would have to have some compromise, but not that many. So from these, uh, so first let's talk about the community's work or artists within the community that are bridging ecology and art. And then let's go back to what that project in Saudi Arabia. And for those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A. We're starting to have a little bit more questions right now. Uh, and I'll get to them as soon as you're, uh, you're done explaining these two things. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. I mean, so this, um... So since the beginning of our uh, project, we uh, we started working with Temporary Art Platform, uh, which is founded uh, by curator Amanda Abi Khalil, and we've had always kind of like the same uh, outlook on, on on public space and common space. And uh, when I explained to her the project that that we were doing, we decided that since the beginning, so the first time that we planted, we actually invited. Um, so the team from A Forest, which are one of the like the leading uh, teams doing afforestation, Miyawaki afforestation uh, around the world. So we invited them to um, to come to Lebanon, and we actually held the workshops instead of just ourselves, like me and my team, learning this methodology. We actually opened it up to 15 people from the community that we sponsored to be able to attend this. So people had to apply uh, by writing a letter of intent and. Um, so we selected, you know, 15 people from all, all different sorts of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. And so they all came together and uh, with Temporary Art Platform, we invited two artists that were interested in these uh, ideas. So Sharbil Samuel Aoun and uh, Amar Fakhouri. And so both of them actually went through the six day uh, intensive workshop, which was, I mean, partly was uh, in a classroom, but most of it was actually in the field, visiting the forest with a botanist, learning about the native species, and then learning about the way of cleaning up the site, of planting, and of taking care of the forest. So we really wanted to have the community involved, not just as just volunteers, but really to really participate and to learn so that they could then use this, these learnings and start applying them themselves. And uh, so we kept on doing these uh, different collaborations, which happened uh, and uh, and we won a, a couple of grants uh, which we couldn't use because of um, uh, covid but this uh, summer we decided that we are actually going to use them and let's just have this uh, uh, this program uh, started and uh, so this is it art ecology and the commons so we invited uh, a nine uh, regional uh, artists so um, they're artists from palestine from uh, jordan and uh, artists from Lebanon as well. And we had them come over and spend 10 days uh, in Lebanon, studying the forest that we have planted, studying the native forest that we have uh, emulated, uh, talking to uh, botanists, to different uh, type of um, uh, experts, uh, discussing ideas of colonialism, uh, discussing the eucalyptus trees that, that were present on site, uh, discussing uh, you know, why, like, um, you know, this river, I mean, has disappeared from our consciousness because we don't see it anymore and it's hidden behind this, like, concrete wall. So what are the different ways of bringing the people back so that they can rediscover the river, however dirty it is, but at least it, it, it brings a sense of awareness and it brings more, it gets more people interested in understanding the history of the river and hopefully to actually decide to do something about it. And so this is, uh, and so what I showed here is, is just like a sampling of the things uh, uh, that were done. Um, there were, you know, interventions on billboards. Like at that time, the economic crisis was uh, at its peak. So all the, the billboards around Beirut were empty. So a couple of artists, um, Christian Zahir and Amar Fakhouri took over uh, one of the billboards and actually flipped it from its vertical position to a horizontal position and added a staircase. So people would actually walk up the staircase and then they were framed by the frame of the billboard, but they're actually using the billboard as a terrace. So they were gaining a higher viewpoint that they could see the river and they could see into the river and they could also see the forest from above. 
So, you know, kind of like these really interesting um, uh, interventions and um, uh, also um, Rana Haddad and Pascal Hashim who took over the intersection uh, at the corner of the, of the forest and they blocked it uh, with their physical bodies, uh, with tables and chairs that they brought. So they brought the uh, traffic to, uh, to a standstill. So they were reclaiming the street itself. And they had this beautiful, very poetic performance with um, uh, charcoal, so wood that had been uh, burned for various uh, kind of like, you know, reasons. And so the, the fragility of those and, and kind of like dancing with them and dropping them and having them shatter into pieces. So kind of hinting to the fragility of our economic system, our short-sightedness, but also the fragility of the ecosystems that we are uh, working with. So that was a really beautiful uh, project. And then with the Metropolis Cinema, we had almost 10 days of uh, uh, screenings that, that were happening uh, inside the forest itself. Wow, that's so beautiful. I can't wait to talk to you about another project that we are working on and, and looking to, to, to create in Lebanon. So that feels super aligned with, uh, with everything. And now we have 17 questions, 18 questions in the Q&A. Maybe we address those before we go back to the project in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Leila Ferrali, hi Adib. I wonder if you could share about traditional building practices in the Levant that naturally so, fall into so the So Leila is the, is the quote that I read. Uh, oh, you know, earlier, the, the Zaytun. So this is, hi Leila. Hi Leila. Leila is also in chat. Uh, Leila is asking, uh, I wonder if you could share about traditional building practices in the Levant and naturally fall, that naturally fall into the biomimicry or regenerative building philosophies. Uh, I mean, lots of uh, different practices, but basically the idea of using earth as, um, um, as, the, main, as the main material, uh, because this is what was abundantly available and it has a very uh, a high thermal mass. So in the Levant where we have, uh, you know, uh, hot and dry summers, this, this became like a really uh, important uh, uh, building methodology. And this was used in different forms from excavating into the earth to uh, making a brick, whether it was fired brick or unfired brick. So in Egypt, for example, um, you know, they had these uh, unfired bricks, uh, uh, which, which they were using and that uh, architect uh, Hassan Fathi also extensively used and, and researched. So I would suggest you look into the work of, uh, of Hassan Fathi, for example. Um, but also you, uh, like using earth as um, rammed earth. So similar to the way concrete is, uh, to, to the way that concrete is used, but instead of using cement, using uh, earth and clay and, and different types of uh, uh, straw and husk and things like that that go that go into it. Um, and so this is, I mean, this is all uh, inspired because our, our ancestors were looking at the natural world around them. So inspired by uh, uh, anthills, by termite mounds, uh, by even birds. Uh, there are some birds that use a natural type of concrete to build uh, several story uh, nests. So all of these references uh, or let's say inspirations uh, that were used. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's so great that, you know, traditionally we used all these natural elements and we're so close to nature and because of said modernization. And if you even look at the architecture of modernism, uh, it's basically like a design for death, exactly like the concrete, the use of concrete, the use of all these materials that are so not in harmony with nature is directly associated in architecture and in design with the rise of modernism. So when we're so um, eager to be modern, right? It's uh, also especially the Middle East and Lebanon has been very much uh, um, sort of amazed by this idea of European modernism. Like it's basically above everything else. When, when we are running towards this idea of modernism, it is also running towards the idea of designing for death rather than designing for life. It, you know, I, I just thinking out loud here with you, feel free to chime in as I pick another question. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, definitely like worldwide, you know, the rise of modernism. But uh, in Lebanon, uh, I mean, I have to say that it was also um, transformed to respond to the climatic conditions uh, of Lebanon. So we saw uh, additions to the modernism movement uh, here with uh, uh, louvers and sunscreens and uh, types of mashabiyas that were uh, that were modernized in uh, uh, in these uh, in these buildings. So they were actually much more than right now, they were actually uh, much more in line with uh, the natural systems, at least, you know, in terms of uh, weather than we are right now, where we solely rely on artificial means of heating and cooling. And, you know, like we close off, like in Lebanon, you know, now there's, um, it's by law, you can close off any balcony that exists. So now what developers do is that they just automatically close off the balconies. So Beirut went from being a city where people lived because we have many months throughout the year where it's really pleasant to be outside. So where you'd see these beautiful balconies filled with flowers and plants. And then this law came out and uh, all of these spaces, outdoor spaces were closed off and given back into the, uh, to the private space. And so you don't have that interaction with, with the street, you don't have that interaction with the air outside and you lose all the types of vegetation uh, that was there. And that's really sad. Yes, and also uh, after the war, it was kind of like uh, fashionable to close the balcony for some reason. So <laughs> uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, Anna saying, are you required to buy the land in order to restore it? Or is it all done in public lands? So we have two types of projects. We work on public lands, and this is uh, land that's owned by governments or by, you know, by local government, by municipalities and things like that. Um, so we sign like an MOU with them where we are, uh, I mean, they call it beautifying. So we are beautifying, uh, instead of them doing it, we are beautifying these spaces. Um, and so, so no, there is no kind of uh, transaction uh, uh, that happens. Um, so we have an agreement with them that they uh, agree to uh, protect this land uh, and to, you know, to not cut down the trees and all of that. Um, and on the other hand, we work with private landowners uh, to like convincing them to, that instead of uh, implementing conventional landscaping, that they implement uh, these uh, native forests because they will become self-sufficient. They will not cost them any money. They will save uh, all kinds of like chemical fertilizers and, and uh, uh, pesticides and all of that. And they will save the watering and maintenance uh, that is usually required in, um, in conventional landscaping. Next question would be, how can we start our own native urban forests? So there's lots of, um, there's a lot written about the Miyawaki uh, method. I mean, the, basically it's, I mean, you need to understand the way that the method works. And then you need to have a, a botanist that you will go and discover the closest natural forest to your, um, to your project to study, uh, to study that and to be able to understand what types of species are there. Then you need to partner with nurseries that that have these uh, uh, native saplings, uh, so that you can use them. But there's um, so with uh, a forest, uh, they are producing. Uh, they started a Kickstarter campaign, I think, about a year ago, and now they are producing um, a guide, like a step-by-step -step guide to forest making, uh, in I think in twelve different languages. So. So they're starting to release them uh, at the moment. So I, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely advise you to look for a forest and then see what, uh, uh, you know, I think like on Facebook or something like that, they, they're starting to release these uh, videos. So you can actually, uh, um, you know, learn the step-by-step -step, uh, process. And you can also, sorry, I mean, you can also uh, look through, um, so we have, uh, so our partner is uh, Sugi, Sugi Project. And they, so we're a kind of collective of forest makers all over the world, uh, from the US to Europe, to Australia, to Asia. And um, you can also start there and see if there are any forest makers around you. And then you can go and volunteer with them. You can of course ask them to make a forest for you, but otherwise you can go and volunteer for them and you can uh, learn uh, the methodology um, that way. Thank you so much. And I. 
uh, saw here the organization Suji project and the team responded and Mariana also, thank you. Uh, Emma Sleiman, how can we engage high school students living in Lebanon in these projects? So we are uh, reaching out to schools, to universities. We work, I mean, uh, you just have to understand we are, we are a really small team. We're just three people. Um, so in addition to our architecture projects, we do uh, the um, forest making project. So we rely a lot on the help of volunteers. And so we try to do that through social media, through talking directly to, to schools, to universities. So sometimes it's, it's difficult to you know, get to the right people. But uh, we've done it with so many different schools. We've done it with uh, kindergarten um, uh, students. We've done it with uh, university students. We've done it with the elderly. I mean, it's really anyone, like absolutely no uh, prior knowledge uh, required uh, can join the planting and uh, definitely can join the maintenance uh, as well. So yeah, working with the, with the scouts, we had also uh, different groups of the scouts that, that came um, uh, to work with us. So the idea is that if we can define, I mean, we have these 10 forests across uh, in different parts of, uh, of Lebanon. So you can find the interested parties that, you know, they reach out to us and we organize for them specific days uh, for maintenance, let's say, in, in the area that is closest to them. So we have partnered, for example, with uh, an NGO called Himaya, which works on um, uh, violence against, uh, against uh, children and youth. And so as part of capacity building, uh, we have two sites uh, where uh, they work with the youth on the, on the maintenance uh, of those forests. I can't keep up with the chat. So there is FFF Lebanon. Yes, uh, Fridays for Future Lebanon. Ah, uh, Fridays for Future. Got it. Of, okay, Fridays for Fridays Future Lebanon. Thank you. Okay, uh, Audra Mitchell is asking. I noticed that remote volunteering and academic research are needed. What would be most useful in this regard? Uh, I mean, we have. Uh, I think the the the, the point that we. At right now is that we need to scale our impact uh, because of the very dire conditions that we are living in in Lebanon, but also that the world is um, is seeing. So we need to kind of brainstorm. What does that mean? How can we scale the impact? So the impact can be scaled through one planting more. So uh, needing funds to plant more, uh, needing uh, corporate sponsorships to plant more, but also it's about. I mean, the same way that we're doing these. Um, uh, programs with temporary art platforms. So doing this, you know, like this, these artistic interventions, uh, we can come up with different ways of, of having uh, these topics being raised at different levels. So whether it's government or policy, uh, whether it's through social media. So when I talk about re remote volunteering, I mean, for example, we need help with our social media. Like, you know, we are not, uh, like we're hardly active enough there. We have so much visual content, so many pictures, so many beautiful pictures of species and birds and, and insects and the forest growing. We have so much video content and all, you know, like all of that and uh, not enough, uh, you know, bandwidth already to, to work with it or to understand what, what to do with it. So we have a lot, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of how we can um, start kind of showing the impact uh, more. Uh, also helping in raising awareness about our work because i mean being based in lebanon of course we have like most of international media is interested in covering the problems in lebanon and when you approach them with something like this you know there's not as much interest because they'd rather you know cover this in europe these tiny forests are coming up and in the us you know and so like, like the guardian and these uh, bbc and all of that but they hardly mention like this is happening in in this part of the world so also like that would be another way to, uh, to help remotely uh, in terms of academic research. I mean, again, to be discussed in more detail, but there's a lot that can be done there in terms of helping us see how we can measure uh, the changes uh, uh, in the soil, let's say, how the soil is being transformed um, and maybe writing uh, papers and, and things like that. Yes. Daily Rose is asking off topic, what is the artwork behind Adib in the frames? <laughs> I am intrigued. Um, they so mean something this, on the topic? 
Uh, sure. Uh, so this is um, a Qatari feminist artist called uh, Wahida Malullah. And it's about, um, uh, I have to show it to you. I don't know if you can see all of it now. Um, it's basically, it's a series of 20 photographs of herself. So it's a self-portrait. Um, and this is a very old work. I mean, very old work. This is uh, from about 10 or uh, 12 years ago. Uh, talking about the oppression of the of the of the veil, um, of having uh, the veil kind of delete her identity. So we go from this white on white, like her wearing the white veil. Uh, we go from the white on white, and then she starts painting herself uh, into into blackness. So completely um, disappearing. So that's the that's the story. Thank you. It's off topic and may, may or may not have something to do with this, but thank you so much. I also was always intrigued by the artwork behind you. Um, the, Ramona is asking, uh, she's a BioL fellow. Do you encounter issues with people violating your forests? How do you deal with that? Such great questions. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Such great questions. Surprisingly a lot. So when we, when we planted our first forest, uh, you know, our, um, so the people at A-Force, our consultants, they said, you know, you need to fence this area because this area is not going to survive. The plants are too fragile. We're like, no, but this goes against what we're trying to do. We want this to be a public space and all of that. And so we didn't fence it. And so it, within the first week, we had a fire, a small fire in the forest. We had so much trash. We had people coming in and uprooting plants and taking them away with them. Uh, we had people using it to defecate in. So it was a really uh, bad experience. So we ended up uh, fencing uh, fencing it with the idea that after about five years time, the trees are, um, the forest is big enough that it can withstand vandalism. And that hopefully by that time, we would have engaged the community enough that we have protectors, you know, and we have people using the space and so that it, it becomes uh, better um, taken care of. Um, so yeah, definitely lots of vandalism. In one of our other projects, we have um, kids that jump over the fence, and uh, you know they take away the sticks, they 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 break them, they trample the plants, they uproot the plants, and then they just leave. So so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, uh, kind of like even more community engagement. Even but I mean the problems. This is like societal problems that are slightly larger than us. Yes, oh my gosh, there's so much to awareness that we need to, to create around this. I'm so sad to hear everything that that you all have been, you know, going through essentially when you're putting something together for the community and the community takes it apart. It's very, very stressful and sad and heartbreaking. Sarah Forsyth, and we're going to go through a few other questions, and then sadly, we're going to have to save the other questions for you to respond uh, in another time because we're almost out of time. But Sarah Forsyth says, Thank you, Adib. How can the average citizen take steps to implement urban native forests in their cities? I think you may have answered that before. Uh, do you feel like you want to ask? Sorry, uh, uh, Celine, you broke up. Could you repeat the question? Yes, it was, uh, how can the average citizen take steps to implement urban native forests in their cities? Oh, you yeah. kind so of we responded, covered, but we do you have anything else to add besides what you already have said? I mean, just that really, uh, just do something, you know, like whatever it is that you're interested in, that you think, however meaningless you think it is, like, you know, we started by, you know, let's plant a few trees. And then this snowballed into the movement that we are creating right now. Like I didn't have the intention to scale this so much. It was really about doing this one project by the river to, you know, to raise awareness about the river. And then it became so much bigger because it just snowballed. So whatever you're interested in, however meaningless you think it is, it's just important to do something uh, and, and then watch how, how things will work. Because people will get attracted to that, to that passion. Thank you so much for that. Um, to that question, uh, Colin is asking, how, how have you been able to get any municipal or governmental support? Because in Lebanon, that's very rare. <laughs> Zero. Okay. So how did you do the, 
So the so the way that okay, so a bit of a back kind of like story. The reason why we started with the Beirut River is that since 2013, when the government decided to put these solar panels on the river, and I was against that, I kind of like sent a letter to the different ministries, kind of urging them to reconsider. Because instead of, you know, every like all over the world, rivers are being renaturalized. And here we are adding like more artificial things onto the river. Something that's great, you know, it's renewable energy, but there are so many rooftops over Beirut that uh, all over Beirut that they could have put these panels on. And uh, I dug uh, into it and it turns out that actually, so the, I mean, there's obviously a lot of corruption in Lebanon. So the project itself costs 10 times more because of the concrete structure that needed to span uh, the width of the river so that they could install the solar panels. And this is where you can make money. It's by, you know, so, so it became clear that this was like uh, a project. I mean, the location was, was chosen for very specific reasons. Anyway, so I had been fighting this project. And so I was doing that for six years, coming up with different plans all over the river, renaturalizing the river, doing lots of different urban interventions like urban acupuncture and kind of screaming and shouting, you know, like this is the river and we need to do something about it until I went through a burnout uh, like in like 2017, 2018. And I just stopped because I, I just couldn't handle like it had become so much and, you know, nothing was was happening. It was so intangible. And uh, when when my wife got pregnant, I I've kind of like uh, kind of like had this this kind of kick of energy again, because I was thinking, you know, if I if I'm not doing something about it, like I can protect her, you know, we eat organic food, we grow some of our foods, we do, you know, lots of things. We don't use any uh, chemical products at home, but I couldn't protect my kids from the air that they're going to be breathing in, in the city. And so, you know, so this is one of the ways that led to us actually planting that uh, forest. But what I wanted to do is that I wanted a project that was very tangible, that people could get behind. And that was also very uncontroversial. So, so this is why like uh, this idea of this, so a friend of mine, she's the founder of Sugi Project. So she's the one who, who actually approached me and said, you know what, I know you've been working on this project and let me connect you to Shubendu from a forest. Let's start this project uh, together. And that's how it started. So it became so easy because planting a tree, first of all, is not seen as something like from one side or another, not seen like as by, you know, like partisan or, uh, a religious or anything like that. So all different groups like could get behind uh, this idea. People could just come and just take selfies of them planting a tree or people could come and actually learn a lot more and be a lot more involved. And that's why for me, it's a very political act because we're doing this without needing to approach higher levels of government. We just need to approach like the local government and to convince them. And uh, we're reclaiming these uh, degraded spaces. So, so we start with the fact that we have no support. We just need this uh, agreement uh, with the local government to say that we can use this land. And through Sugi project or through donations or corporate sponsorships or all of that, this is how we raise funds uh, or through grants that we've won and, uh, and such. And uh, we use the help of uh, volunteers. Uh, we ask from the municipality to water, but that's, that's it. And they don't uh, necessarily always do it. So that's why our success rate sometimes falls uh, to around 70% uh, because the watering is not done properly, but that's, you know, that's too much uh, for us to be able to do. So that's the only thing that we ask them in terms of support. But even then, when we're not asking them to pay money, when we're not asking them to do the work or anything, it's very difficult to get their approval because they actually just, don't care. Um, so, so you know, so the, the Beirut River project, we are very lucky because the, that particular mayor is very open to our ideas. And he's let us, you know, we started with 200 square meters. We are now at 2,200 square meters in that location. And now he's just giving us, given us approval for another 10,000 square meters along the river. So it's when you find these kind of partners that makes it uh, easier to continue. Yes, there was someone asking if I effectively about funding in one of the questions, so I'm going to pass. There's too many questions, actually, uh, and then we, we need to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, one of them that caught my attention, and of course, feel free to click on Q&A, 
and see for yourself if there's any any particular question that caught your attention, Adib. You can stop sharing your screen so you can have more freedom in uh, navigating. But it would be nice if you chose the last question. So uh, you know, as you are looking oh, through so that, so much pressure. <laughs> huh? So much pressure. Uh, la la la, no pressure. Uh, last <laughs> question, Adib. Uh, someone asked you what's the origin of your last name. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, uh, we don't really know. I haven't done the, the exercise of looking through the family tree. Uh, it might have some Turkish origins, but we're not really, uh, not really sure. Okay, thank you for that. That was the last question from my end. Also, uh, Leila Frali again asked, do you have a sense of what year the river stopped being used for freshwater in Beirut? I think you kind of mentioned it. It's in the 60s. So 1968, the river was encased in concrete, uh, uh -huh. but I don't know when it stopped being used. Uh, uh, you know, where that, uh, when it, I'm like, I'm not really sure about uh, that uh, specifically. Uh, okay, so, so many, so many questions. I, I, I don't know, I don't have time to read them. Uh, there's one which is how do we combat degrading non-native species in our environment? Okay, let's go with this one as the last uh, one. So in our case, there were uh, uh, there were eucalyptus trees uh, on the side that we uh, that we planted. So I think there were about six of them, and we actually had to cut them down because, and this was a very long discussion that that happened with um, with the people uh, that we that we worked with with the community. Uh, with different experts uh, as well. Uh, but so when you think of it of like at the, at the, you know, now, like I look at this tree, this beautiful eucalyptus tree with so many, you know, like uh, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking to have to cut it down. But then when you think at the timescale of the forest that we are coming and implementing, which is going to hopefully survive for hundreds of years, it doesn't seem so bad to, you know, to kind of, again, reclaim, uh, uh, remove those uh, trees that were ill-conceived. Like, I mean, it's not the fault of the tree. It's just that, you know, the, the you know, like the French came and they planted them there or other people came and planted them. Uh, so we really have to think of the long-term, uh, uh, the problems with the loss of biodiversity, the problem with the loss of our native uh, species and kind of take the, make the hard decision to, to actually get rid of those, if they are aggressively invasive, so eucalyptus is very aggressively invasive. It gives off chemicals, it dries out uh, the land, and all of that. If it were other, like uh, other types of species, so we have other projects where we have other types of species that are there, which don't actively harm, then we we keep them and we plant uh, around them. Amazing, and thank you so much for for that. We personally here in the slow forest where we are in New York upstate, we have been trying to uproot a lot of invasive species and colonial, uh, green colonialism that occurred here. And honestly, it's like battling, it's like uh, battling against nature. It's like, almost impossible to get rid of a lot of things that are just invasive by nature. Like even if you uproot everything and you dry them and then eventually burn them, which is the best process, because if you compost them, they're just going to grow in the compost. If you it's so invasive, it's crazy. Uh, it almost is like a lesson in patience and acceptance and such a Zen moment to be able to <laughs> get to and realize that because it's almost impossible to get rid of an invasive colonial species once it's been planted. Uh, do you have that in Lebanon too? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's very difficult, uh, especially with the um, uh, Ailantus uh, tree, which is called the tree of heaven, but we call it the, the tree of hell. So it's originating uh, from China and it loves these degraded lands. So it, it loves these areas, it reproduces so fast, and then it attracts all kinds of invasive insects and invasive birds and all of that. So it's really just, it doesn't just disrupt the ecosystem on that piece of land, it's really uh, disrupting the whole like ecosystem at many different uh, levels from the microbiology in the soil all the way up to the, you know, to the, to the birds that actually uh, come around. The plant of hell. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much, Adib. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Jenny and Nick from our team who is organizing Access. Uh, thank you for Nicole and Krista who were trying to sort out your 100 uh, slide deck. 
um, <laughs> with Nick because you had so much more to say. So maybe we can do a second class very soon where you can do the part two of what you missed out. Any last words, uh, Adib? <clears throat> I, I mean, I do, first of all, really, really want to thank you so much. Uh, your team has been incredible. And there's such, I mean, your work is such a source of uh, inspiration for me personally and for the work that we that we actually do. So I'm very happy to be able to play a, a small uh, role um, in that. Thank you so um, much. Eddie. A big love to Paloma yeah. also, who's been capturing the best parts of your speech today so we can do a proper recap and support our editor and yes we sent a note to our editor that because when you shared full screen we had some blocks still we couldn't see the full screen so we will work at post-production and uh, making sure we're seeing all the slides um, <clears throat> and a big welcome to Zoya who's joined our team recently any last words I mean I guess you just said your last words <laughs> More last words. Again, just do something, please. Just, you know, like everyone, just do a little tiny thing and it's it will make so much, so much of a difference. Thank you so much. And yes, we can all make a difference and we do just a little bit, anything we can, where we are, however we are, it helps a lot. Thank you so much, Adib, for this amazing talk, amazing conversation and um examples of solutions that you've brought together and we're so excited to continue working with you as a research uh, fellow of the slow factory and can't wait to show everyone what we're working on behind the scenes and of course as nick is saying in the chat please join our slack continue the conversation there uh, there's so much uh, stuff happening in slack that uh, would serve uh, everybody the resources and uh, the the book club and the conversations and thank you so much, Adib, and talk soon. Thank you again, Jeremy and Jenny and our entire team. And of course, thank you to our beautiful audience. Your questions were amazing. We're going to save the last ones and get back to you all. Bye. Bye.